more than 1,200 years ago. From across the North Sea, longboats, raiders, Vikings, attacking without warning in search of silver. Those are the stories and the narratives that have been told over the years. History still tells us all this was built on ill-gotten gains, that the Vikings rose to power by plundering all around them. But in reality, that's not quite the truth. From old ideas to new discoveries, new knowledge, challenging what we thought we knew. Did the Viking Age really just begin when Scandinavians first went raiding? And of course, nobody switched on that button that said, oh, we're Vikings, let's go raiding. Vikings before Vikings. This is the true story. Vestfold and Telemark, in the south of Norway. In part one, we met Ragnar, Terje and others as they try to understand their region's intriguing Viking past. Still today, school children around the world are told that the Viking Age began in the year 793 AD, with the Scandinavian attacks on Britain. Because of this view, we think of the Vikings becoming wealthy and prosperous by pillaging and stealing. Yet experts in Norway and the UK are challenging that view. And they're trying to understand this mysterious and monumental burial ground from the Viking Age, Bora. It was already long established before Scandinavians took to the sea to go Viking or raiding. So where did the power and wealth to build all this come from? to grow the Viking society before it burst its borders and flooded out into Western Europe. That's what Ragnar Orton Lee and the team are trying to find out. They're finding that for once, it's a story of Vikings not about raiding and loot, but of trading, goods for sale, silver changing hands, commerce, wealth. Archaeologist Terje Gonsson, Ragnar, and the Vestfold and Telemark Kulturav, or Cultural Heritage Team, know that somehow Bora is the key to understanding how the Viking Age began here. But it's a real enigma. Where does Bora fit in with all this? Bora is kind of the... What is Bora? That's kind of the, the big puzzle in this. Bora is famous for its monumental burial mounds, but even by the 1980s, almost nothing else had been found there. Before, we were puzzled that the, we just had mounds here. And of course, was this a place just to bury important persons, kings, queens? And every so often, Bora gives up another of its secrets. This was the case around 30 years ago. Bora Park is highly protected by Norwegian law, so to have done any archaeology there is something, but Terje Gansom has dug there several times. Now he's the head of Vestfold and Telemark Kulturav, but back then he was just starting out. I was a very young archaeologist and that was some of my first experience excavating here at Boyre in the early 90s. That photo was taken while I was excavated right here. And in 1991, I had here. We were a whole team, but uh, this was my little spot. They were only allowed to dig small trenches here. And while they found the remains of structures, possibly evidence of settlement, they couldn't really get an overview of what they were looking at. I knew that we didn't get the whole grip in the early 90s. That puzzling would go on for years until they got permission to explore some more. In 2007, we were able to test out with the GPR, georadar, to survey some areas here. Ground penetrating radar was a fantastic new tool for archaeology. And the team hoped it would help them understand the site without more digging. The GPR team planned a routine wide survey area, but Terje had a different idea. I told the guys who run the georadar, don't do that, 
take 25 meters wide and 100 meters long test along the fence. Tadia's instincts were proved right. The radar slice made sense of what they'd actually excavated back in 1991. And suddenly we realized we have been inside the whole building doing excavations. No one had expected this. We were inside without knowing. They discovered a whole building, a longhouse. It was a big structure, a classic Viking hall. The 1991 structures were actually its internal chambers. From the geo radar results, they could investigate the post holes that would have supported the hall's great structure. They were 1.6 meters deep, meaning it was likely a tall, impressive building. And it's huge, it's massive. Obviously, we, we're talking about a huge building, a high building, not, a, not an ordinary uh, longhouse. In fact, when they properly unpacked the data, there were actually two buildings. I'm standing at the end, the northern end of the building. So the short end. Uh, and the building is, uh, has uh, curved walls. So we're looking into a long hall here. It opened up a new dimension to Bora. It could no longer be seen as just a burial place, even for kings and queens. Now it seemed Bora had been some kind of royal manor site. It led to more interest and more surveying. And then, if anyone was in any doubt about its status in Viking times, in the winter snows of 2013, Bora relinquished another of its treasures. In March 2013, we put the georadar behind the skido and uh, prospected the whole area. And we found even a much huger hall, 63 meters long, and um, that's one of the biggest hall buildings ever found in Scandinavia. On the slope, above even the other hall buildings and burial mounts, it would likely have been visible from far out in the fjord. A display of power, wealth and tradition to maintain your trade network. I think this is uh, part of what it takes to be a royal manor. You need to show off, you need an old history. Um, the mounds is showing that you have your ancestors here. You need to show power and you have to be generous. And these, the whole buildings are the place where these uh, negotiations and these actions takes place. It's known that the sea level in Viking times was more than three meters higher than now. Climate change is an issue for us today and it's clearly been a factor in Norway's past, but the change with the sea level took place over centuries. What if change happened much more rapidly? In wider archeology, span it's now accepted something bad happened. The archeology span does seem to suggest that sometime in the early to mid sixth century, something changes in Scandinavia. In quite a lot of sites in the archaeological record and it seems to be that society is uh, being challenged in some way. We don't exactly know what that is. Around the 530s AD, graves become less ornate and there are fewer of them. People are spending less time on elaborate funeral rituals. There are signs of crop failings with no full growing season for two, perhaps three years. People turn back to hunting and fishing. The finds for this time become more Spartan. It's quite possible that there was something that was affecting the population on a really quite a vast scale, and that seems to have impacts on the society and how that developed too. So we see social changes, we see different types of objects and artifacts appearing, and it's really intriguing to try and link those two together, to try and understand what the trigger was, what the sort of catalyst was for that change. In recent decades, various theories have been put forward. One suggests that a comet might have impacted with the Earth's upper atmosphere and exploded. Something similar happened over the Siberian region of Tunguska in 1908, killing thousands of reindeer and flattening the trees for hundreds of miles. Current research is leaning towards a volcanic eruption, 
or maybe more than one, creating an ash cloud similar but far larger than the one in Iceland in 2010. These possible eruptions, around 535 or 536 AD, may have blocked out the sun in parts of Europe and Scandinavia, creating an effect similar to a nuclear winter. Tens of thousands may have died, possibly more. As if this weren't bad enough, soon after, from the early 540s, parts of Europe were badly affected by the first major outbreak of the Black Death, known at the time as the Justinian Plague. We certainly know that these things are happening. We have other parts of Europe where we certainly know it has a huge impact on, on people. Some have drawn a link between the crisis in the 500s and one of the compelling myths from the Nordic sagas. Fimbulwinter is the harsh winter that precedes the end of the world and puts an end to all life in Midgard, or Earth, according to Norse mythology. It's described in the poetic Edda, a collection of Old Norse narrative poems written around the 10 or 1100s. Fimbulwinter saw three successive winters with no summer. Hardship, strife and war followed causing a kind of reset in society. It's tempting to see the 6th century crisis as perhaps being the fire from which Viking society rose. For Ragnar and the archaeological team, the effect of the 6th century crisis is real. They can see it in the archaeology. Society got going very slowly again. It was likely driven by the trading activity along the inner channel to and from the interior of the country. For most ordinary folk in Vestfold and Telemark, it must have taken a long time. We see all this starting in the 700s. Uh, rebuild after the, uh, the climate change. 600s are mainly gone. Uh, in the 700s, we see the build up to what we call Viking Age. Bora, it seems, had the resources to survive. Borre is still functioning through the Finnbull winter and so on, seems to just go on. So everything is not collapsing during, after the, the eruption and possibly a plague and a comet. In fact, Terje believes the crisis may have worked in favour of its rulers. I think part of the aristocracy, which is Borre is an example of, takes advantage of the disaster and move even higher up on rank and conquer a lot of the competing powers. So in a way, after mid 550 AD, you see that the aristocracy, they take a step up and take on a lot of power during that following decade. To do this and to keep the silver flowing, the trading network and its logistics were vital. In part one, we followed archaeologist Petra Schneidhofer as she and the team retrieved ground sensors at Hovland, just inland from the Vestfold coast. There was a feeling that this area hid a Viking past, but when the team first heard about the site, no one suspected just how significant it would turn out to be. In 2019, a metal detectorist got in touch to say he'd found what he thought were Viking Age artifacts. Norway has strict laws on this, and all finds have to be handed over. The finder was new to detecting, and also to the area. Uh, my name is uh, Sverre Nesheim. My wife and I were looking for a small farm like this, and um, uh, we bought this place, and there was six months before we moved in, and uh, I had some time to, to, to look into the history, and I found this old book. The book Sverre found was from 1915, and it told of the local tradition that in Viking times, this had been an important region, maybe one connected with some kind of local power and the worship of the Norse gods. But there was something more. I read here that uh, they thought that uh, this area was an island and there was a waterway passing the farms here. By coincidence, this was totally separate to the work the Kulturov team had been doing to recreate the Vestfold coastline, as it was in Viking times, before the sea level changed. I, I think about this is uh, my uh, 
Indiana Jones story where I found this old book with the treasure map and then I went out and looking for the treasure. So this is actually the start of my interest for this place. Um, uh, was the start of, of, of uh, uh, me as a metal detector uh, guy. <laughs> Armed with his treasure map and a brand new detector, Sfera tried detecting for the first time. He made some finds, but they were much later, not Viking. But then he remembered what he'd read in the book. I thought that I should search more on the side where the uh, old waterway uh, passing these farms. At the end of his second day searching here, Sverre's hunch paid off. It was getting dark and I was heading home and uh, I, I got a good signal. The signal was for silver, but he couldn't yet tell what it was. It was a little bit dark and so I brought it home and I watched it and uh, uh, I saw clearly this was a Thor's hammer. Thor's hammer, symbol of the thunder god of the Viking age. Not bad for your very first Viking find. I was so surprised and uh, happy because finding a Thor's hammer at Thor's island, uh, that's uh, a great thing. And the first evidence of these stories and theories about this area. Sfera also found a silver knot ring, similar to Anglo-Saxon examples in the British Museum. These were the finds he first reported to Terje Ragnar and the Kulturaf team, who were very interested. The area fitted in with the idea of the inner channel, just as Sfera's antique book claimed. The days after I was out uh, searching all the time, I think in my wife, she will confirm that I was uh, gone mentally and physically uh, for some days there. His next find was really special and he could easily have missed it. And then I, I found this uh, piece, uh, gold foil. <laughs> it's so, so, that height and, and, and that uh, with so, so it, it's so small, it's like a small uh, post stamp, uh, something like that. And, and it could easily go into the trash bin uh, because it, it, it's similar to chocolate paper or something you just throw, throw away. But it felt a little bit different in my hand. Sfera hadn't seen anything like this. Few people have since the Viking age, even in Scandinavia. It was folded. So I had to fold it out, and then I saw its a motif. Svera saw that there were tiny figures in relief on the very thin gold foil. It was a gulgeba, or little old man of gold. Although some, like this one, also showed a female figure. Gulgeba are rare, only found in Scandinavia, and they're thought to be connected with high status or religious sites in the very early Viking Age or before roughly the five or six hundreds. This really got the team interested. So we, we understood that there's something going on here and it's by the inner channel. They decided to try and find out what else Hovland was hiding. And we had this small window of chance so we could do the geophysics here with the Christa and Petra. They were just in time. Petra, Christa and the team got moving with a geophysics survey of the whole area. The way it happened here, we, where everything worked out uh, within two days of, you know, specialist talks to specialist, talks to specialist, everything is put in place, we're coming, the conditions are completely right. Um, and then, you know, you, you do your service, you hope for the best. Petra and the others covered the ground and did the survey. They had no idea that they'd made a really special discovery. It was another building lost since the Viking Age. The next day I was on a plane and I was processing my data in a plane seat. And, and when, you know, the data were finished, I, I just found, you know, saw that, that building in the data. And I was, I was like bursting out with excitement, but I had to be still because I was on a plane. And the guy next to me was actually looking at me while I was like. They wouldn't know all the details for some time, but it was a large structure with massive post holes, similar to those at Bora. Possibly another hall building or longhouse. A great team effort 
had paid off. So of course it's 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 one of the best examples I think how how if everything works together as it should, how well the, the results can be. And it makes me very happy. Through the survey and after, Sfera kept searching. New finds kept adding to the picture. He found scale weights and a silver dirham coin, evidence of trade. Iron slag showed they'd been smelting or blacksmithing. And just in the soil as he walked the fields, more than a dozen hone stones. Some used, some maybe stored for trading, that were lost, maybe when the water's edge was here. The Hovland finds brought everything together. The inner channel, so long just an idea, a theory, now made sense in the landscape, not seen like this for over a thousand years. From the coast, near the mouth of the Numedal River, it ran roughly east and north. Then from Kalpang, Norway's first trader town, linking it with Gokstad Heimdall. And of course, having this inner channel there ties up for a kind of a main highway between Kaupang and Heimdall Goksta. And the inner channel is bang in the middle. Maybe the channel, and others like it, linked with other trader settlements, as yet undiscovered. Then along its busy shipping route, at today's Hovland, there would have been a sheltered mooring. You can see in a sense of a, like a gas station that uh, ships come in, the crew needs to sleep, it's a good harbour. Uh, somebody has been on the sailing for a long time, they need some small repairs, uh, stuff like that. There were maybe trader stalls or goods warehouses. Overlooking, there was a longhouse or perhaps a religious building, given the tradition that the whole area was somehow connected with the Norse gods. They kept the island name. It's still called Tors Island. It's been seven, eight hundred years since salt water disappeared and making it part of the mainland. But it still kept the name, Tors Island. Finally, the channel led north from where the inner channel was perhaps controlled, along with the whole of the trading network. And then, of course, you can't have a channel like this without somebody with political and economical power. For Teria, Ragnar and the team, it's brought about a rethink of how a wealthy society built up here, long before they went across the sea raiding for wealth in the 790s. So, so a lot of pieces are, are falling together. And remember that these guys are living here in this longhouse at the inner channel 200 years before what we call Viking Age kicks in. All this began with a book, stories of a lost island and a tiny silver Thor's hammer. I think there is more to discover. So um, I really hope that some uh, of the authorities uh, uh, from the uh, community that they uh, find uh, resources to, to investigate more. Thor's Island, other places along the inner channel and the huge structures at Bora itself. Such a scale of logistics and construction must have required a huge amount of labor. Terje and the team are only now grasping the scale of all this. There were no machines back then. It's possible to move them, but uh, they're quite big. Every one of these stones on this harbor berm was put there by human hands. Where did all that labor come from? When the longships began venturing from Scandinavia, it seemed the raids weren't just for treasure. There were other things the Vikings were looking for. What sort of uh, commodities are the Vikings taking advantage of? Of course, one of the biggest probably is the slave trade. So the trade in human lives was a vast part of the Viking trade network. Slaves, known to the Vikings as thralls, were at the very least a source of cheap labor for farming and production, and perhaps for building structures like those at Bora. But most of all, their greatest value was probably as tradable commodities. So people are being traded at really quite far afield, but also back into the Scandinavian homelands. But the scale of this is actually really difficult to grasp. 
There have been finds made of iron shackles and chains at some Viking sites, but they can't be accurately dated nor positively identified as slave restraints. And as for the thralls themselves, there too lies a problem. Even if we find graves and skeletons, we don't actually have any way of telling whether those were forcibly moved if they were people who'd been enslaved. Of course, uh, slavery is really hard to find in the archaeological material. We, we don't know what they did with the general public, little less what they did to the trells. They were probably just discarded as waste, uh, but, but we can't trace it in the archaeological material. Lack of archaeology and written records hampers the study of slavery in Scandinavia in Viking times. But that's not the same for everywhere. We are lucky for early medieval Ireland in that there is an abundance of written materials. Claire Downham has studied the existing sources for Viking Age Ireland. Many of them are only now fully coming to light. Quite a lot of these materials were translated between the 19th century and the 1970s. So some of that material um, isn't really fully in the public domain. About the time Vikings started raiding Britain, they also attacked Ireland. By around 841 AD, they'd settled and founded a base at a sheltered basin that made a deep natural harbour. So early Dublin was founded around a dark pool, which is from which the settlement gets its name, so the Lynn Doove of, of Dublin. And this was an area where ships could be moored, so if ships arrived from Dublin Bay, there's a place where they could shelter. The base was located on the boundary between two Irish provinces, Leinster and Meath. A trading base between the two kingdoms meant they could quite shrewdly exploit both. As with elsewhere in the Viking world, slave trading was undoubtedly a part of this. Pretty soon, within a few decades, a ruthless pattern emerges. We then, in the 830s and 840s, get individual captives being taken, but there are some instances in the late 9th century when we get larger numbers of people being taken. Perhaps one of the most striking is in the year 895, um, the Vikings attack Armagh, which was probably like the most important religious centre in Ireland at that time, and they take 710 people away. In the archives Claire has studied, one account that has recently come to light paints a picture of the realities of this Viking kidnap and ransom trade. There's one particularly fascinating source, and this is a narrative that was written um, in the 870s about a man called Fyndon who grew up on the coast of Leinster. Fyndon was brought up in a noble family, which probably explains why his sister was kidnapped. By this time, Vikings knew it was more profitable to sell people back to their own community rather than transport them to some distant slave market. When Fintan goes to negotiate the release of his sister, he's captured as well. Um, and then the Vikings have an ethical debate as to whether it's a good idea to capture somebody who's come to, to ransom another prisoner. So ethical debate, that. I know, it's fascinating. It's hardly the image we have from history of rampaging Vikings. And so the Vikings are said to have this discussion as to whether Findon should be released, and then they release him. And that's probably good business sense, because if you're going to capture people who come to pay ransoms, then people aren't going to come to pay ransom. The account has the feel of authenticity, especially with the chaotic chain of events that comes next. As reference to the kind of complex times that Finden is living with, he doesn't have just one encounter with Vikings. Um, he's captured by them again. He and a neighbouring family of chieftains have been involved in a blood feud together. So Finden's enemies decide to do a deal with the Vikings, and this shows Vikings basically being used as hitmen. If you want somebody to disappear in late 9th century Ireland, you can go to the Vikings and you can negotiate for this to happen. Eventually, Fintan makes his way to the Orkney Islands, where, after more adventures, he finally escapes. This one source tells us so much about the early Viking times in Ireland, and to us now, the unsettling thought of life back then. It is just very hard to think back to a world where slavery was just an accepted part of society. It was normal, if you were a free family, that there would be one or two slaves that worked for you. There was always a risk that a free person too could become a slave. You could fall into debt or simply run out of food in a famine. 
Remote islands, around which Vikings controlled the seas, were useful for keeping slaves before they were taken for sale at markets elsewhere. In the Irish Sea, the Isle of Man is thought to have been one such place, as is the island of Gotland, off Sweden in the Baltic Sea. More buried hoards of Viking Age silver have been found on Gotland than anywhere else, and there are similarities between the two islands in the Viking period. Well, analogies have been drawn between Gotland and the Isle of Man because um, a huge number of Viking Age silver hoards have been discovered in the Isle of Man, and so that sense it seems to have been a really important stopping off point located in the middle of the Irish Sea and a place for, for trade in the same way that Gotland is an island with access to excellent trading routes and is a location of, of many finds of Viking Age silver. The sheer amount of silver found in Gotland has caused a lot of debate among Viking Age experts. So Gotland is a, an extremely interesting uh, case study for all of this because it's a seemingly tiny island in, in the Baltic and for some reason it's got some of the richest and most extreme amounts of silver. A striking feature of the hoards found in Gotland is the enormous number of dirham coins, known to have come from the Islamic caliphates. The Vikings prized this extremely pure silver, mined near Baghdad in the 8th and 9th centuries. How did so much of this silver end up on Gotland in the Baltic Sea? There's something about that location and its, its position in between east and west that's clearly really crucial. But the question is why? Why have they got all this wealth? And if all of that is coming into somewhere like Gotland, what's going out? What's going the other way? What are they getting in return? One of the most likely reasons is the involvement in the slave trade. If human slaving, as now thought by some experts, was the major trade between the Vikings and the East, perhaps Arabia or even further, then the sheer weight of silver found in Gotland begs the question, how many people from Ireland, Britain, or Europe were taken forcibly from their homes and lives, perhaps passing through Viking Gotland, built on the profits of slavers. Whether these are people who are directly involved or if they're sort of middlemen, with, this is a sort of way station, we don't really know, but clearly this is a really key place. If Bora was built on the profits of slaving, even partly, well, there's no written evidence. And archaeology rarely tells the full story of what happened. The Kulturav team have unearthed a lot of information about how the Viking Age developed here and how this happened over not just decades, but likely centuries before our current histories tell us that the Viking Age began. The kings or queens of Bora were already prosperous by then. Harnessing the natural resources of their land, they used the riverways as the ideal logistical network to transit raw materials and goods to and from the trader settlements, and then out onto the fjords and seas to wider Scandinavia and beyond. It's time for Ragnar to put something to the test. After all the research that he and the team have done, he wants to bring it all together and recreate what the Viking Age traders did all those years ago, conveying their wares from the high plateau of Telemark all the way down to the Vestfold coast. Early morning at Saga Usaberg Boatyard, Tonsberg. Ragnar's called in the help of the specialist boat team. Be careful not to go overboard. <laughs> They're dedicated to recreating Viking Age ships like the beautiful Saga Usaburg. And each year, they're the stars in Tonsberg's Viking Festival. Saga Gorkstad is to be the next addition to the fleet, still under construction here. But what they have already in the fleet is what Ragnar needs. It's the Saga Ingling, which means youngster. And it's an exact copy of one of the boats found buried alongside the main ship in the Gokstad Mound. Exactly the sort of boat that the Viking Age traders probably used. And it's heading to waters that its ancestor might very well have known. It's a part of the Numedal River, from Holmfoss, 10 kilometers, down to Hedrum. It's still just as wild as it probably was in Viking times. So now we're up at uh, Holmfoss, and what we're going to do today is replicate kind of the 
trade route from here down to the next farm, which have the same archaeology, which is Hedrum, which is a large farm with uh, lots of burials, rich finds. So they go on a row for 10 kilometers down the river, so we can kind of test how long time it will take, how does the boat uh, navigate in the river. Ragnar's idea is for the boat crew to take downstream a cargo representative of the kind of goods that were on the river in the time of the Viking Age traders. We're going to take a look at some of the typical goods that you would put on your boat. Of course, the big volume would be reindeer. So it's just different kind of antlers, so you can make all kinds of needles, combs, gaming pieces and stuff like that. And of course, you have the, the hone stones. And these hone stones are from uh, the quarry we were at in uh, at Eidsborg. So these are exactly the same ones that's exported all over the Viking world. Uh, another heavy good is your iron. Your iron comes from the iron production sites in uh, the forested areas. And of course, to do this, you want to be paid in silver. So you kind of weigh your goods and check if the trade is good. It's the silver weight, not the coin value. That's uh, the thing here. Uh, we have the boat, we have the crew, and we have the cargo. And of course, a trading run like this from Nes to Hedrum hasn't been done in a thousand years. It's time to load up the cargo. So let's see how this goes. It's intriguing for Ragnar to put his theories to the test. And this is so fun. Uh, so it's pretty, really nice to see how it operates. Ragnar gets ready to time them. So then we set the timer from uh, going from Holmfoss uh, and they start at 11.03. They head off down river. Thor is at the back in the steering position, while Trun, Uli Harald and Steiner will do the rowing. On this first stage, they're off at a good rate. There's a strong current. They're still not far from the Holmfoss waterfall. This part of the river is carefully protected by the authorities here. Ragnar's crew have been given special permission. Local resident Nils Olaf Gjorn grew up here. He knows these waters better than anyone, so he's ideal to keep a watchful eye on Ragnar's crew. This is one of the longest rivers that you find in Norway and definitely the the most significant river for transporting valid goods like iron and, and so on. And it's still really significant for us. And um, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have uh, business at this part of Norway if it wasn't for the, for the river. A little further on, it might look idyllic, but the river here is not so benign as it first appears. It's a good thing that Niels is here. Just checking the river here now, because uh, normally this is a place where you can easily flow over with the boat to be sure that they won't scratch the bottom at all. They will cross over the river and follow on the rocky side. In the boat, Steiner is now in the bow as lookout. They've realized that there are hazards all around them. Submerged tree trunks and other debris. Bumping into one of them could crack the thin planks of the boat's hull. Even in mid-river, there are sandbanks, and they're very hard to spot. At one point, some of the crew have to get out to nudge the boat back into the stream. For the crew, the locals and Ragnar alike, this is epic. It's a sight not seen here for a thousand years or more. Finally, they make it to their destination at Hedrum, and Ragnar's there to meet them. Two hours, 15 minutes, and 22 seconds. Wow. So how did you think the boat operated on the river? Very good. Beautiful. Really good. But it, it was uh, easy to row also upwards, yeah. uh, the current. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's easy. Quite easy. Yeah. No, no, we haven't done some training. 20 minutes. Give us some food and uh, something to drink, some yeah. beer, and then we can go. Yeah, so yeah. 15, 20 minutes. So. Yeah. That's good. Good. Yeah. Nemos problemas. This construction with a relatively narrow boats and uh, very light 
build. I can see that immediately there's a direct line between this boats and the boats that were used in thousands along the coast of Norway uh, until the beginning of the 1900s. At the strong currents, when you have higher water level, then it's good to have um, a flexible boat. And we were extremely maneuverable up there, both with the rudder and with yours. Yeah. And when you know the river, and it's pretty well loaded at the bottom of the boat, I agree with you, I think you can make this in less than an hour. Yeah, I'm absolutely convinced about that. The scale of this kind of logistics network back in Viking times begins to take focus. All over Norway, Sweden, you would have this river system with literally thousands of boats going on like this. And that, that makes us much, uh, much easier to understand the massive production of iron, massive production of home stones in Eidsborg and those places. Because you can move those heavy goods so easily on these navigable rivers. It's a culmination of the work the whole dedicated team at Vestfold and Telemark have been engaged with for several years now. From the trader settlements on the coast to the high mountain plain at Hardangavida in Telemark. Raw materials from the natural wilderness bound for distant shores. All had to be transported down this river and others like it, including, as revealed by the team, the previously unknown inner channel. This whole society had evolved and become prosperous a long time, even centuries before, as school children are still told, the Viking Age began in 793 AD. So then you start seeing the scale of this and then you start understanding the logistics behind the trading market with, with these goods. And you start seeing the, the industry behind this. And it's quite extraordinary. The story of Bora and its great wealth and monuments to long dead ancestors wasn't born of thievery from Christian holy places across the northern seas. It was born of a highly developed, commercially structured society, a trade economy with at its heart networks forged by relationships, honour and obligation. New knowledge through dedicated research. And it's all adding to what we know about the Viking Age. Trying to understand the Vikings is like trying to unravel a mystery. And I think that for me is the hook. We're always gaining new insights into how we can evaluate that material. And I, I think that's incredibly important. The rise of the Viking Age was presided over by kings and queens. But these weren't the real driving forces, the lifeblood. I think actually it's going sort of closer to the ground, thinking of all the people, all the hundreds and thousands of lives that actually made up the biggest story. All of those enslaved people, all of those traders. Those lives, I think, are really what can tell us the true story of the Vikings. Back at Hedrum, the people buried here weren't kings or chiefs, but modest traders and river folk. Some of those people who really built the Viking Age. So basically now we're standing at Hedrum. At this site, three to five boat burials from the Viking Age are known. And they've probably done the same trip as we've done today, many, many, many times during their lives. And it's just nice to see that, at least at this site, uh, they are still here. Their burials are kept and it's still here.